the Churches of Christ present Bible Talk. One of the strongest men in the Bible is the man Samson. Samson was blessed by God and possessed great physical strength. But as strong as Samson was physically, he lacked strength in a greater, more important area. Stay tuned as we study Samson, a man who lacked strength. Hello again and thank you for joining our study of God's Word today. There would be no reason for us to be here on the air if you were not joining us today. And As always, I want to give you my personal thanks for giving me this blessed opportunity to study with you today and I pray that you find the study fruitful and helpful. The topic of our study today is Samson, a man who lacked strength. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that title really doesn't make any sense. You know, Samson was one of the strongest men to ever live. Uh, Samson was uh, the one who slew a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Samson was the one who killed a lion with his bare hands. What do you mean Samson lacked strength? Well, Samson was a man of great physical strength. There's no doubt about that, no denying that point. Let me ask you. What good is all the strength in the world physically if one cannot exercise strength over self? Samson, for as strong as he was physically, struggled with self-control, the mastery of self, exercising strength over self, especially when it came to women. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But I want you to notice that by the time you come to Judges 16 and verses 15 through 22, as Samson is ready to tell Delilah the secret to his strength, uh, that by the time you get there, uh, he's already shown himself to be an individual who lacked self-control. And in Proverbs 26 and verse 11, the Proverbs writer said, As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. And we see Samson doing that over and over and over again. You'll remember how Delilah asked him over and over again, Tell me the secret to your strength. And Samson just keeps playing this game with her, acting foolish in doing so. So how is it that one of the strongest biblical characters failed to control himself, and what was the end result? I want to notice with you first by examining Samson's life, looking at Samson's example, that his lack of self-control, his lack of strength over self, stemmed, number one, from poor companions. Samson shows time and time again through the text to really be a, a bad judge of character. If you go back to Judges chapter 14, Notice with me that it begins in verses 1 through 3. And says, Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I've seen a woman in uh, Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. His father and his mother said to him, There's never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all thy people 
that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Now, here we see Samson has picked out a, a woman, a daughter of the Philistines, to be his wife. And his parents, his mother and his father, advise him against this first marriage uh, because of the fact that she's a daughter of the Philistines, which is a violation of the law, Deuteronomy chapter 7, or would be. But God had always wanted His people to stay away from the idolatrous inhabitants of the land. Now, understanding that this would be a violation of the law, his parents said, don't do this, don't marry this woman, marry you know, uh, somebody from among our own people. But Samson had already made up his mind and wanted this woman to be his wife. As you continue reading in Judges chapter 14 and you come to verse 20, you see that he loses this wife to his best friend. As you continue reading throughout uh, Judges chapter 14, you'll find that Samson had set forth a riddle which she helped the Philistines solve. Samson, in killing the lion, had passed by again later on and had seen that bees had uh, been producing honey there. He then takes that and turns it into a riddle and presents it to the Philistines and says for seven days they could not answer the riddle. But they sent his wife to ask him, to beg him, tell us the answer, tell me the answer, so that she could then reveal it to them. Well, eventually on the seventh day, Samson tells her and she goes and they, she reveals the answer to them. They then tell the answer to Samson and he knows immediately that the only way that they figured it out was because they had used his wife to get to him. Now what's interesting is, is that in the fit of rage over this situation, Samson goes down and kills 30 men of Ashkelon and then comes back. But when he comes back, he finds that his wife has been given to his companion. In fact, the ESV says in verse 20 that she was given to his best man. Can you imagine having chosen not only a wife, but chosen as a best friend, as a best man, who would then do that to you, to, to, to go off together? Uh, Samson was not an individual who chose good companions. And then in Judges chapter 16 and verse 1, we find him spending his time with a harlot, which gives another occasion for someone to try and to trap him. And so over and over again, Samson proves to be a poor judge of character until finally, Judges 16 and verse 4, Samson falls in love with another woman, a woman just as wicked and conniving as the first, this woman's name being Delilah. She was nothing more than a puppet for the Philistines, a woman who was far more interested in money than she was in matrimony. And you know the rest of the account. Samson surrounded himself time and time again with poor companions and his temperance, his self-control ultimately paid the price. But not only did that lead to a lack of strength over self for Samson, but also his, his playful attitude, if you will. Not only was Samson a poor judge of character, but he was also a poor judge of the seriousness of his situation. He was a poor judge of the dangers that were around him constantly. Time and time again, as I mentioned in Judges 16, Delilah's asking the question, what's the secret to your strength? Tell me the secret to your strength. And time and time again, Samson gives her an answer. But look at some of the ridiculous thing that, things that he comes up with. In Judges 16 and verse 7, he says, Well, if you take seven fresh cords that have never been dried, you know, uh, verse 11, he says, Well, you've got to tie me up with new ropes that have never been used before. In verse 13, he says, Well, what you really have to do is you have to take the locks of my hair and weave those seven locks of my hair in, in a particular kind of web. Do you see the way that it's just sort of a, a game to him? You know, he's just sort of, you know, having fun with her. She's wanting to know uh, the secret to his strength and he's just you know, giving these ridiculous answers. And any fool could see that she's behind all of this. You know, I think about the old expression, you know, uh, fool me once, you know, shame on you, but fool me twice, shame on me. Samson, after giving her these answers, these things begin to, to be carried out. 
Any fool could recognize that she was the one behind all of these attempts. And yet Samson continues to play the game. Samson continues to play this game with her, never taking the time to realize the gravity of the situation until it's too late. And then you have the fact that there was so much pressure, so much pressure from Delilah to reveal the secret to his strength. And to me, Judges 16 and verse 16 is key to this point. Notice that in Judges 16, 16, we read, It came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. In other words, Delilah had pleaded and begged with Samson so much that he was almost, you know, I wish I was dead. She won't leave me alone about it. You think about the way that Joseph resisted the constant plea of Potiphar's wife and in a similar fashion, she had come to Joseph day after day. And so it is that Delilah comes to Samson day after day, pressing him with her words. And her words, verse 15, were hurtful words. Notice what she says in verse 15. It says, She said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. I want you to imagine for just a moment the person whom you love, whom you have chosen to be your spouse, your helpmeet, and to have that individual come to you day after day after day after day, constantly accusing you of not loving them. And imagine how hurtful that would be and how that would begin to wear an individual down over the course of time. Joseph, as Potiphar's wife, tried to wear him down day after day, eventually found himself in a situation where Joseph just said, I've got to get out of here. And he runs away from the problem. But Samson didn't run. Samson cracked under the pressure and he reveals his secret to Delilah. And then I have to think that part of what led to that, part of what led to his lack of self-control, was previous losses in his life. I can't help but think that Samson's past experience played a role in his giving in to Delilah. Again, if you go back to Judges chapter 14, remember the issue with Samson's first wife. In a similar fashion, there was a secret that she wanted to know. And she came to him day after day for seven days, crying, pleading to know the answer. And he finally answered. But in all of that, keep in mind that Samson lost his wife, and he lost his best friend. He lost what ESV calls his best man, his companion. And I can't help but think that somewhere in Samson's mind, after Delilah has pressed him day after day, saying, you don't really love me, that somewhere in his mind Samson thinks, if I don't tell her, I may lose her too. Coaches often talk to their players after a tough loss about not letting one loss become two losses. In other words, you know, don't allow this one loss to, to affect you so much mentally and emotionally that you can't properly handle the next game or the next set of circumstances because if you don't do that, then that one loss can turn into two losses. And Samson, I believe, allowed his past experience, his first loss, to turn into two losses to cause him to compromise. And then to some extent, we must recognize that Samson's inability to display strength over himself was a result of pride. You know, somewhere in the discussion of Samson, pride must have played a factor. Somewhere in Samson's mind must have been the thought, I'm unstoppable. You know, after all, imagine growing up and spending your entire life being stronger than everyone else around you, stronger than, than anyone else had ever seen. And if you had escaped the Philistines time and time again, as Samson had done, perhaps you would begin to think too, I'm untouchable. These things can't happen to me. I'm, I'm stronger than everybody else around me. This is perhaps seen in Judges 16 and verse 20. 
after he has revealed his secret to Delilah and after she has cut off the locks of his hair, she says, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. It may very well be the case that Samson rises and goes out to face the Philistines just as he had done every time before without even realizing that the Spirit of the Lord had left him. Why? Because he's thinking, I can take them. This, this, you know, I can take anybody. With all that said, Samson, for all of his flaws, when the time came, was still strong enough to repent. Which brings us then to his penitence. In Judges 16 and verse 28, when the time came, the text says that Samson cried out to God. Yes, Samson had his struggles and and as much as he struggled, as much as he made mistakes, at the end of the day, Samson still displayed great strength because when the moment came, he was strong enough to get on his knees and cry out to God. And in this, his greatest feat of strength was accomplished. Notice Judges 16 and verse 30. As Samson cries out to God, and God again blesses him with strength, the text says that Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all of his might, and the house fell upon the Lord's and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. His greatest feat of strength was accomplished the moment that he cried out to God and found true strength. Then the question is, so what? What does all of this mean for us? How can Samson's example and his inability to show self-control help us in our walk with Christ? Well, we need to learn from Samson the importance of self-control and we can help to exercise strength over self in a way that Samson had not. Number one, by choosing good companions. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 that evil companionship corrupts good morals. Think about what Peter said concerning Lot in 2 Peter 2 and verses 7 and 8. Remember, Lot had chosen those cities of the plains to be his home. And Peter said that that righteous man had his soul vexed day after day by the things that he both saw and heard. There were members of Lot's family who perished when those cities were destroyed because Lot chose to pitch his tent toward Sodom. We must surround ourselves with good companions. The Hebrews writer showed the value of surrounding ourselves with brethren, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. As he said, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Samson shows us that this point is especially true in whom we choose to marry. We must choose our spouses wisely. Samson's downfall was in large part because of the women that he chose to surround himself with. Let us choose our spouses wisely. Let us not surround ourselves with people who pressure us or who seek to use love against us. But instead, let us surround ourselves with individuals who, number one, want us to go to heaven and want to help us take as many as we can with us. Secondly, we can learn from Samson that if we want to have strength over self, we must count the cost. We must choose good companions and then we must count the cost. Because we choose to live in harmony with the will of God and God's Word, there are going to be through the course of our lives friendships that are not maintained, relationships that go by the wayside. But we can't let such losses sway us from temperance, sway us from self-control to keep ourselves in harmony with God's will. Again, I have to believe that Samson's previous loss of his wife and his friend played a role in his later loss with Delilah. We can't let those kinds of losses deter us from doing that which is right in the sight of God. And that was part of Jesus' whole point in Luke 14, verses 26 through 27, when he said, Except a man hate father, mother, wife, children, brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple." And then we must see the consequences of sin. We must never make the mistake of treating sin 
like a joke, like a plaything. The old adage is true, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. And Samson kept going back to the flame. We cannot treat sin as a playful thing that is not to be handled seriously. We must be careful to not treat the lack of self-control as if it's just some, some game or some joke. We must also avoid the thought, it'll never happen to me. What a dangerous way to live. A way to live that says what's affecting and what's happening to other. You know, I know that so and so fell off into this, but that'll never happen to me. That's a dangerous way to live. And friends, you can be sure that if we sin, if we choose to live in sin, that eventually we will reap what we sow. Galatians 6 and verses 7 and 8. Paul said that he which soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that which soweth to the Spirit shall love the Spirit, reap everlasting life. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's a dangerous way to live, to say it'll never happen to me. And friends, sin can seem like the undertow of the ocean. You know, on the surface, everything looks pleasing, even refreshing with appealing sights and sounds. But you wade out too far and you get pulled under. And by the time you've lost control, it's too late. Self-control and sin is nothing to play with. We must see the consequence of sin and we must see the gravity of self-control. And then when the time calls for it, we must, like Samson, be willing to cry out. Like Samson, when the occasion comes, we must be willing to cry out to God. You know, Samson, for all of his faults, is still listed in Hebrews chapter 11, that hall of fame of faith, just like David. And it's for this reason, because regardless of their shortcomings, they had the strength to turn back to God. The real show of strength, the real show of self-control, is seen in the surrendering of one's own self to God. And James tells us in James 4 and verse 10 that if we will humble ourselves before Him, if we'll draw nigh unto Him, then He'll draw nigh unto us. And friends, we have this promise, Romans 10 and verse 13, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? Have you cried out to God? and shown true strength, true self-control? If not, then won't you do it today? How does one do that? How does one call on the name of the Lord? Well, it begins first with faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. A faith which then leads to repentance, to a turning away from the life and the practice of sin, Acts 17 and verse 30. It certainly involves confessing Christ with our mouths, Romans 10 and verse 10, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then it culminates in the act of baptism, being fully immersed in water, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to have your sins washed away. In Acts 22 and verse 16, as Paul recalled his own conversion account, spoke of how Ananias came to him and said, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you haven't called upon His name, if you've not cried out to God, won't you do so today if need be? And if you're striving to live faithfully, then continue to exercise strength over self. Thank you again for tuning in today, and God bless.
Do you have any questions about the Bible? Are you searching for a place to worship God like you find in the Bible? Do you have questions about your eternity? Would you like to know more about God's plan for you? Let me encourage you to visit a Church of Christ near you today. And if you're interested in learning more about the Lord's Church, we also offer free material. For more information or if you would like to have a transcript or a copy of today's program, whether audio or video, please go to our website at www.bible-talk.org or you can email us at bible.talk at bible-talk.org. You can also write to us at Bible Talk, P.O. Box 40, Fayette, Alabama, 35555. Simply include the program number and we'll be happy to send that to you completely free of charge. Thank you again for tuning in and may God bless you richly in your walk with Him. Singing provided by the Edmund Church of Christ, Edmund, Oklahoma, producers of In Search of the Lord's Way. You can visit their website at www.searchtv.org.